goals at this time. So that's my brief little blip on time management, because I do think it's, uh, it's false economy, although, you know, medical school is, is changing a lot, but, uh, you know, not to, uh, to, to, to cram for these uh, tests and pathology, et cetera, et cetera. Sepsis syndrome, a differential diagnosis of the flu-like illness. To give you a 42-year-old woman with uh, this case ended up in court, chills, nausea, and diarrhea, temperature of 102, Blood pressure, 90 over 50, pulse 120, normal exam, white count 6,000, given a diagnosis of gastroenteritis, dehydration, IV fluids, and sent home. What's wrong with that picture? Excuse me? Yeah, she's sick. She's very sick, and uh, she's given a presumptive diagnosis that might be wrong. And as it turns out, uh, she died of bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia. And uh, the, the body, as you know, as you're learning in pathology, can only react to injury in a, a few ways. And one way that it reacts to stress is uh, you get you know, sick in your you feel sick in your gut, but this person is sick, given IV fluids to send home. The most important aspects of, of, of medicine three are diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. The normal white count probably threw them off. Nobody looked at the cells, and one of my mottos is to let the leukocytes talk to you. Actually look at the peripheral blood smear and, and see whether you've got bands and holes in the polys and toxic granules and all of that. Sepsis. Uh, was called by a 19th century Philadelphia surgeon a rude unhinging of the machinery of life. It reminds me of this shipwreck painted here by Turner. Uh, and as we'll see, just about everything in the body goes haywire in sepsis. Traditional definitions for what we're going to talk about are bacteremia, meaning a positive blood culture, the presence of uh, organisms, usually bacteria, can have fung fungi or other organisms, in the blood, sepsis, the harmful consequences of microbes and their tox or their toxins in blood or tissues, septicemia, meaning bacteremia with clinical manifestations, and then septic shock, shock caused by sepsis, often with a positive blood culture. Uh, and this makes this distinction that if we look at the world of people with positive blood cultures, and the world with, of sick people, people have signs consistent with sepsis. These people, what's wrong with these folks here? What, what does that tell you about their blood cultures? They're false positive, or they might be transient bacteremia. They're in inconsequential, back to positive blood culture. But in general, in clinical medicine, we get lots of blood cultures because blood cultures are worth their weight in gold when they're positive for, for telling you uh, something. And septicemia meant bloodstream infection. That was people with signs of illness who also had positive blood cultures. These definitions have been revised, uh, and it's, it's really, a, I think, mainly a semantic uh, distinction. But they've been revised uh, as follows, uh, and, and this is not stuff that's going to be on my exam and not stuff to... Uh, and to really harp on, because I think these are arbitrary definitions, but it will come up on the wards. Uh, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and that's a term coined to take into the, uh, the, the, the idea that other things besides infection can cause sepsis. I just uh, came from a hospital where I was asked to see somebody who had a, a high white blood count, for example, and uh, she, she had lots of things that might explain being sick besides infection. Sepsis would mean inflammation, systemic inflammatory response caused by sepsis, and then severe sepsis in which there's evidence that one or more organs is in trouble, kidney failure, decreased urine output, clouding of the consciousness, abnormalities of blood coagulation, uh, uh, hypoxemia, and then septic shock defined as uh, 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 hypotension uh, or shock uh, that does not respond to uh, simple uh, fluid replacement. So 
The systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, a term that you'll encounter, basically defined by abnormal vital signs, a high temperature, a high respiratory rate, and either a high white count or a low white count with a bandemia, immature forms. The respiratory rate is a, a commonly overlooked physical finding that's not taken accurately a lot of times. You'll see people just write down 12 or 16 or 20. And my preferred way to do it is to put your hand on the belly and look at your watch. If tachypnea is an important finding, what would tachypnea, an increased respiratory rate, indicate in sepsis? Sure, it, it's an it's a, a attempt to respiratory compensation for uh, metabolic acidosis. Uh, very, very good. And it is important that some people will have a normal or low white count with a bandemia, and oftentimes these people are very, very sick. Sepsis would be an inflammatory response plus document infection. Severe sepsis, I've already given you that definition, organ dysfunction such as lactic acidosis, oliguria, altered mental status or hypotension. Septic shock, hypotension despite fluid resuscitation. And here's the key distinction. The hallmark of septic shock is low systemic vascular resistance. If you look simplistically at three different types of shock, in hemorrhagic shock, by definition, the blood pressure, the blood volume is low. In cardiogenic shock, failure of the heart is a pup, the blood volume is normal. And in septic shock, the key word is sequestered. The uh, blood volume is normal, but it's sequestered peripherally in inappropriate places for perfusion of vital organs. So in septic shock, the blood volume is sequestered, and low systemic vascular resistance would be a hallmark. And a unifying idea, and these ideas continue to evolve, and what's happening in the basis for this systemic inflammatory response syndrome is endothelial damage that causes a generalized inflammatory response leading to then this cascade, sepsis, sepsis syndrome, septic shock. And the patients who are in uh, today's intensive care units with multiple lines on ventilators, et cetera, et cetera, frequently have multiple organs that have been knocked out, and the mortality rate goes up exponentially as one after another organ begins to uh, fail. This rather elaborate slide uh, uh, simply, uh, it's almost an incomprehensible slide, isn't it? <laughs> Somebody drew. Systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, we note that pancreatitis, burns, trauma, and other insults to the body, like sepsis, can <coughs> cause inflammation. So as I pronounced this morning, we treat infections, not high white, we treat patients, not high white counts. Sepsis, the world of uh, things wrong with you, is a result of infection. And then in this subset, we have positive blood cultures, for bacteria, fungi, parasitemia. In a review article that I wrote some years ago, I, I suggested the term microbemia to separate this, just microbes in the blood. And the editors uh, threw that out. They didn't like it, which is a shame, because I thought it was a perfectly good word, but probably too many words out there anyway, aren't there? <clears throat> in severe sepsis, and we're going to talk mainly about positive blood cultures in this hour. Blood cultures are positive in about 20 to 40 percent of cases. So there's a low uh, sensitivity, but again, uh, they're worth their weight in gold if they're not contaminants. In septic shock, blood cultures are positive in about 40 to 70 percent of cases. One implication that you see from this slide would be there's going to be a lot of empiric antibiotic therapy going on, right, which drives uh, drug resistance and other things. So let's talk a little bit about blood cultures, which for uh, a long time was my, my major uh, sort of research hobby. There are a number of ways that you can look at, at positive blood cultures. It can be uh, one is true positive versus false positive could be contamination or pseudobacteremia. And some organisms, and this has been evaluated by correlating blood uh, cult culture results with meticulous review of charts by several observers, and some organisms uh, are usually contaminants, coagulase negative staph, et cetera, contaminants about 95% of the time. 
Because other organisms, such as the pneumococcus and gram-negative rods, are true pathogens about 100% of the time, always true pathogens. Staph aureus, interestingly enough, is uh, a uh, true pathogen only uh, about 75% of the time. And that would be the case uh, because staph could be part of the blank flora on a transient basis. Skin flora, skin flora. You got it in your nose. Uh, a study in the London, London subway suggested that at a given hour, 30% of the people stick their fingers in their noses. So, you know, you're going to have bacteria transiently on your skin. Transient versus intermittent versus continuous makes the point that Say we get blood cultures throughout the day. An occasional blood culture might be positive in, in all of us. We might have bacteria in our blood, which are fairly promptly cleared by the reticular endothelial system. So transient bacteremia is usually inconsequential, but can, to amplify in the previous lectures, play a, a role if you have what going on? What was that fancy Latin phrase I threw out? Earlier lecture. You're looking at him, he doesn't know anything. <laughs> a locus, what was the rest of it? You're clueless? A locus minoris resistentiae, right? Place of least resistance. <laughs> it was at the tip of your tongue all along, was it? A locus, a locus minoris resistentiae. And so this becomes very important. This is, for example, uh, you know, having an abnormal heart valve, some aortic regurgitation, for example. If, if you have a, 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 a transient bacteremia going on, then bacteria will, will cover this in the rest of the remainder of the hour, will settle out there, and all of a sudden you've got endocarditis, right? So this is the basis for giving prophylactic antibiotics in people with heart murmurs who have certain heart murmurs before dental extraction, for example, right? So transient bacteremia has a role in pathogenesis. Intermittent bacteremia, some blood cultures are positive, but not others, but not all of them, is characteristic of most infections that give the uh, bacterial infections, et cetera, that give rise to positive blood cultures. And sustained or continuous bacteremia, that means all of the blood cultures are positive, is, uh, is characteristic of intravascular infections, most famously endocarditis, but also uh, uh, infected AV fistula or dialysis grafts, uh, sepulchral thrombophlebitis from IV catheters, uh, and uh, certain other examples. Sometimes you just have a few bacteria in the blood. Other times you have massive bacteria in their blood. Some, usually you have one organism. Sometimes you can have several, especially if you had, say, a complicated intra-abdominal infection. Primary versus secondary means whether or not you have a recognized source, secondary bacteremia, as opposed to no obvious source. If there's no obvious source, you should think endocarditis or you should think a, a line infection. Clues to contamination. Uh, certain organisms uh, are usually contaminants, such as coagulase negative staph. And then the patterns of the number of cultures, fewer, you'll get this from the wards in spades. It doesn't fit the clinical picture. It d doesn't fit the clinical picture. Transient, intermittent, and sustained or continuous. Transient again manipulation of a flora-containing body surface. And there's a large literature on uh, the, the frequency of positive blood cultures after brushing your teeth vigorously, doing an, an endoscopy, uh, uh, having a, 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 a trach done, having a urologic surgery done, things, uh, debriding an ulcer vigorously. Uh, and we mentioned popping of zits earlier. I'm not sure that's been studied. Maybe y'all could volunteer for that. Uh, but I don't see many zits out there, so we probably couldn't. But uh, there's a large literature on the frequency of transient bacteremia, again, important for pathogenesis, intermittent and sustained or continuous endocarditis, endarteritis, sepulchral thrombophlebitis, infected <coughs> AV fistula. Any questions so far? I'm going to skip that. Sepsis is clinically a very important uh, problem, <clears throat> contributes to uh, about three times as many deaths as uh, 
highway accidents. Overall incidents are said to be very substantial. Most cases occur in patients hospitalized for some other illness. Others, of course, occur in, as community-acquired infections, so it's very common of sepsis. And uh, in the hospital, uh, this has become, over the past half a century, a, a, a very major issue because of the things that we do to people. Gram-negative bacilli were the story up until about 1980 because it became recognized that as penicillin and other antibiotics cured gram-positive infections, we began to see gram-negative infections in people who were very, very sick. In recent years, gram-positive cocci have become the storyline, particularly drug-resistant ones, and, and this is, I think, in part due to our rampant use of lines in anybody who comes in and gets sick. Whereas if you got sick in the, around 1830, if you rolled in for any reason, I would get a lancet out of my pocket and bleed you. Now, if you roll in for any reason, I'm going to put in a big line, right? How many of you worked in hospitals? Hey, do you agree with what I just said? Sure. You know, you get a big line. Whatever it is, you've got to have a line, right? A lot of what we do, be, be, take a skeptical attitude with you. A lot of what we do it has to do with the style of medical practice and the climate of it. Fungi are also, uh, when I, I studied all positive blood cultures in Columbia for five years between 1977 and 1981, and didn't even include fungi because they, they were not even a, a, a yeast, they weren't even a blip on the radar screen, but now yeasts are, 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 are very important. Host factors, uh, lots of studies have shown that the likelihood of dying from sepsis is directly related to the severity of underlying disease. Rapidly fatal disease, meaning if I just look at you and say, you're probably not going to walk out of this hospital, uh, very high mortality, ultimately fatal, something like uh, uh, that you would die from in five years, untreated renal failure, severe heart failure, cancer in any form, versus non-fatal. Most of you, if you had a bacteremic illness, uh, would survive. The uh, mortality would be, uh, rate would be very, very low. Older people have a higher mortality my data indicate that the mortality rate begins to rise about in the fifth decade of life, after which you're no longer very important to the gene pool, right? We're kind of made to self-destruct. Mortality is greater in people who have subnormal temperatures than in those with fever, which is important because uh, usually fever is a thing that tra attracts our attention. Now, against this background data, we're going to uh, contrast gram-positive sepsis and gram-negative sepsis. Uh, for quite a while, there was great interest in gram-negative sepsis. Uh, notice that an interest particularly on endotoxin, lipid A moiety of endotoxin, and this contrasts a gram-negative rod with its complicated uh, layer of lipopolysaccharides and lipoproteins here on the outside, whereas gram-positive cocci tend to have a simpler, tend to have tychoic acid here. So differences were suggested. And it was suggested that the hallmark of gram-negative sepsis was that endotoxin, as we'll see, activated uh, Hegeman factor, factor 12 in the peripheral blood, which caused four bad things to happen, four sequences of, of plasma protein cascades. One, it activated uh, the kinin system generating bradykinin causing vasodilatation early on. Two, it activated the, uh, uh, and obviously the intrinsic coagulation pathway causing disseminated intravascular coagulation. Three, simultaneously, it activated the plasminogen sequence which would dissolve the clots as they formed, and therefore you had what was called a consumptive coagulopathy where you used up your coagulation system and you began to bleed all over the place. And fourthly, it activated the complement system. <clears throat> However, and I, I redrew this uh, slide from data, when you look at people with established shock, there's no hemodynamic difference between gram-positive and gram-negative septicemia. So the gram-positive bac bacteria can do the same thing, although it's a little bit later. The point of this slide is if you look at cardi cardiogenic shock and septic shock, <clears throat> 
Notice that with cardiogenic shock, by definition, the cardiac output is low. The peripheral resistance is variable. It's the opposite with septic shock. In septic shock, the peripheral resistance is low, but the cardiac output is variable. And indeed, there's a lot of information suggesting that the ability to survive septic shock is in part dependent on the ability of the heart to adjust. So a unifying idea now, and this gets more and more complicated with, with each passing year, and I'm sure you've had a lot of this, that endotoxin and other molecules as possessed by gram-positive organisms does a whole bunch of things. It activates Hageman factor, causing these things to happen. It activates endothelial cells, the system of macrophages, really causing the production of cytokines, activates neutrophils, and also activates the complement system, and all this leads to this systemic inflammatory response. So that that's sort of an overview. And uh, again, it gets more and more complicated. Uh, if you had the role of nitric oxide in your earlier lectures, you've had all that stuff, and uh, this slide will be, uh, you can pull it up, I guess, on your computer and kind of look at it, and et cetera, et cetera, and you probably understand it a lot better than I do. But uh, you notice the peptidoglycan, which is in gram-positive uh, bacilli, binding of lipopolysaccharide in gram-negative bacilli, and here you have lots of cytokines being released, increased nitric oxide in the endothelial cells, vasodilatation, for example, release of prostaglandins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Clinical findings in sepsis. Early on, patients look bad. I mean, they look sick, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I had to learn this the hard way on, on the wards, uh, just hyperventilation, altered mental status complications. A lot of bad things happen. So full-blown sepsis is sort of a, you sort of kind of get so you recognize it. This person is bad, bad, sick. Kidneys shut down, tubular necrosis, liver, heart failure, GI. And notice as in, in the patient that I started off this hour with that nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea can be the initial manifestation in systemic lactic acidosis. So all of this stuff, again, to kind of get back to the poem that we quoted yesterday, just knowing these little facts and asking questions, being skeptical, very important. Now, we, here we start to get into some of the questions for the exam. Petechiae early in the course suggests especially meningococcemia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There's a skin lesion that we're going to talk about, mark this well, ecthyma gangrenosum, characteristic of pseudomonas sepsis. Toxic shock syndrome, if somebody gets red. About uh, three or four years ago when I was, uh, I guess it was earlier, that it came out in 2002, is when I was doing a textbook of infectious diseases in primary care, I sent a survey to uh, 600 infectious disease specialists around the country looking for mistakes. I'll talk about this tomorrow a little bit that they've seen made in, in primary care. And one of them uh, was uh, it led to death or disability. And, and one person wrote in uh, that this uh, staphylococcal toxic shock, and some uh, doctor, I guess, in student health clinic said, this co-ed can't be very sick. She's been out getting sunburned. And staphylococcal toxic shock. People without spleens, pneumococcal sepsis, very important. There are other critters that can also do that. This is in your handout. I'm not going to examine you on it. You were, uh, if you had no spleen and were, were camping in Rhode Island, it might be Babesia macrati, which looks like a little bit more like malaria on a peripheral blood smear. If you were a male carrier and got bitten by a dog and had no spleen, it might be Capnocytophaga canamorsis, dog bites. And the encapsulated, other encapsulated bacteria can do that. We'll talk about that a little bit. Meninga, uh, we're going to show the lesions of uh, the meningococcus tomorrow. Rocky Mountain spider fever we're also going to show. Staph aureus, purulent purpura, pseudomonas again, marked as well, ecthyma gangrenosum. We showed yesterday the rose spots of typhoid. <clears throat> 
endocarditis, bacterial endocarditis, which we're going to talk about in this lecture. And you should be able to roll out and uh, just roll off the tip of your tongue when you present a patient. Uh, there were no ulcer nodes, splinter hemorrhages, Janeway lesions, or petechiae. That is medical speakeasy for I considered endocarditis. Anthrax we're going to talk about tomorrow, the lesions of that, et cetera, et cetera. These are some of the meningococcemia, early lesions, fluent purpura. Mortality here is very high. Meningococcemia, red spots on the skin. Skin rashes get of this sort, a lot of importance. Ecthyma gangrenosum, pseudomonas. Pseudomonas sepsis, particularly in oncology patients, it evolves into this black eschar. What's basically going on there in, in pathological terms? Why would the skin be black like that? Necrosis, what's going to be another term? Excuse me? What did you say? Death? Good. What's another term? Excuse me? Infarct, infarction, right? It's basically an infarction of skin due to deprivation of its vascular supply. And it turns out that Pseudomonas is an opportunistic, or, opportunistic organism, but once it gets a foothold, it has an ability to invade the walls of blood vessels. It's angio invasive. So, what you're having here, as I look at it, is an infarction of skin. We talked about disseminated gonococcal infection yesterday. Here's some more examples of that. This was a uh, patient I saw in practice some years ago, a former Miss Lexington County. Notice the uh, excellent uh, manicure and the diagnostic lesion of the gonococcal arthritis dermatitis syndrome. Staphylococcal bacteremia. We're going to talk about a little bit. We talked about staph, and staph are increasingly very, very important. I'm going to skip over this slide and that one. And, and this from a wonderful review article uh, recently. And I'm going to offer the uh, pointer to my <clears throat> budding genius over here and have him explain uh, ICAM. <laughs> and all this good stuff. <laughs> but obviously. <clears throat> And the point is, it's all these wonderful things of the Staphylococcus going in here, causing abscesses to form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wonderful chance to correlate what's going on with the patient uh, being uh, very, very sick. And more and more, uh, new drugs are being developed with the attempt to form monoclonal antibodies, for example, against a lot of these things, tumor necrosis factor and other stuff, and that's going to be an emerging story. <clears throat> We're going to talk about some syndromes, uh, staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome, high fever, rash that desquamates, and these toxins that cause uh, active superantigens causing massive cytokine release, staph toxic shock. And you've had this to some extent, is that correct? What? So I'm going to, no questions for me about this um, this year, and I wrote these questions last night. But this is a rash from toxic shock. It looks like a sunburn. And unfortunately, this di fairly diagnostic finding of the skin peeling off comes late. So that's, uh, you know, what it was. And uh, oftentimes in staph toxic shock, which can result from a wound, the source is not uh, a, a, a Apparent. In contrast, in streptococcal toxic shock, usually there will be some evident source. Streptococcus can also express superantigens release, resulting in massive cytokine release. About half of the patients will have necrotizing fasciitis. Yeah, notice the non-specificity of these early symptoms: chills, fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which might uh, direct your attention at the gut. And this was a patient with 
streptococcal cellulitis, for example, and note the primary streptococcal infection there. <clears throat> Sepsis in the asplenic person, mark this well, frequently fulminant with massive bacteremia, pneumococcus, up to 90% of the infections and 60% of the deaths, and we mentioned these other organisms. Why would that be, sepsis in a splenic person causing death, often within the first year of splenectomy? The way I look at it is the spleen is sort of a strategic uh, place for the early response to infection in the absence of specific antibody, one, for mechanically trapping bacteria, and two, for uh, generating the early uh, immune response. I give you a 24-year-old white male with headache, nausea, and vomiting, been in excellent health, smoked marijuana a little bit, sent home with symptomatic treatment, came in the next morning moribund. I had known this little boy and grew up across the street from me. What's wrong with that picture? Excuse me? What? What? No, he didn't have, he hadn't had his spleen out. He had meningococcal disease, headache, nausea, and vomiting, and that can be looked at. He was treated for gastroenteritis. What are the signs of increased intracranial pressure? We'll talk about this tomorrow. Meningococcal disease, little red spots, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to tell you about my buddy check. This was a, a person who uh, was a student at the University of South Carolina sitting on a stretcher in the emergency room at Richland with these little red spots. And this is one of the few things, overwhelming meningococcal infection, that can kill one of you within an hour or two. One of the few infectious diseases that can do that. This is why meningococcal vaccine is being prioritized for freshman college students. These are other lesions of meningococcal sepsisemia. Meningococcal disease in this country is uncommon, so people are going to overlook it. It's uncommon. And this is by way of review. A question that's apt to show up on exams, it's not going to be on my exam this year, but, it's, but to, know, to know about is that people with late-acting complement deficiencies tend to have recurrent nice serial disease, meningococcal or gonococcal. And this is because that's important for the serum bactericidal system, which, as you recall, is a system of, uh, that in which complement plus antibody, type-specific antibody by the classical complement uh, pathway, nonspecific antibody by the alternative complement pathway, actually punches a hole in certain organisms. Any questions there? This is a 64-year-old man coming in with fever, hypotension, cellulitis, bullous skin lesions. Had been, got back from New Orleans. He had a history of cirrhosis where he ate raw oysters. What's he got? Excuse me? He got what? Vibria, Vibria vulnificus. So remember, if you have cirrhosis of the liver, you should not eat raw oysters, right? <coughs> you should not eat raw oysters. I went to the oyster club last night. It was written up in the newspaper a few years ago, and I got quoted in the newspaper saying that. I hope it helps somebody out. Vibria vulnificus, by way of review. Cirrhosis. Chills, fever, wound infection. Any questions there? We're going over some key syndromes very rapidly. 41-year-old man with the worst headache he ever had, myalgias, rash, returned from camping in the Smoky Mountains a week before admission. What's he got? Rocky Mountain spotted fever. What rash did we t talk about yesterday that involves the palms of the hands? <clears throat> 
What? Secondary syphilis, right? That would be a macular rash. This is a particular rash. Unfortunately, at seven days, only 43% of people, according to one study, had a rash, even at seven days. So this may not help you out early on. So that will burn you. Uh, there are five infectious causes I know of the worst headache ever, and they are Rocky Mountain spotted fever, meningitis, brain abscess, sphenoid sinusitis, and falciparum malaria. Now, for the remaining uh, seven minutes, we're going to uh, do only very partial justice to uh, one of most internists' favorite diseases, starting with this case history of a 65-year-old woman with diabetes who, during a flu epidemic, has fever, chills, and aching all over, comes in, got bi-basal rolls, no heart murmur. She's admitted for treatment of her heart failure, and she dies with endocarditis. We're going to talk about infective endocarditis here. These are terms for endocarditis. We're going to talk about this one. The terms acute and subacute are, are seldom used nowadays. Non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis simply makes the point that you can have clots on the heart valves that are not infected. And in endocarditis, septic vegetations in the endocardium usually involve the heart valves. Acute endocarditis, normal heart valves, highly virulent organisms, Staph aureus is a prototype. Subacute endocarditis, less virulent bacteria. Mark this well. Viridan streptococci are the prototype and the most common cause across the board still of endocarditis. Classically, in endocarditis, the main features are a predisposing valvular lesion, multiple positive blood cultures, embolic phenomena, and then some evidence of an active endocardial process. And I'm going to skip this for time. In the pathogenesis of endocarditis, what is thought to happen is that one has particularly the subacute model, a, uh, a lesion that predisposes, and as I'll show in a, another slide, this is particularly things like aortic regurgitation and micro regurgitation going that way, or a ventricular septal defect with blood going that way from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. And what happens is you get a, a little thrombus that will form right there, and these kind of drawn by form on an ongoing basis, which is one reason the valves eventually become deformed and scarred. And if you happen to get bacteria in your blood, classically from pulling a tooth or something, but say you get, brush your teeth vigorously, whatever, get a viridan strep in your blood, the bacteria will settle out in that vegetation, and then they'll proliferate unchecked because white blood cells can't get in there. And then these vegetations can, of course, break off and go elsewhere and set up shop elsewhere. This idea was developed as, as follows, that uh, if you take an abnormal uh, blood going from a high-pressure chamber to a low-pressure chamber, as in aortic regurgitation across the, from the, in, the, in diastole, blood goes from the high-pressure aorta to the low-pressure left ventricle. In mitral regurgitation and systole, blood goes from the high-pressure left ventricle now to the low-pressure left atrium, and also from the high-pressure left ventricle to the low-pressure right ventricle. And so every time, the vegetations will form here, and you can do the same thing uh, by, say, taking a test tube and putting agar in it and then sending, uh, squirting a, a, a column of fluid down with bacteria in it, and the bacteria will, will form colonies right after that uh, uh, constriction. And this shows you what I've just put on the board there as to why the vegetations form on the 
ventricular aspect of the aortic valve and the aortic regurgitation, atrial surface of the mitral valve. You can also get a jet lesion, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is just a sterile clot from non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. This is a removed valve in somebody with bacterial endocarditis. There's the valve there. This is this clot. Notice these clumps of bacteria standing with the hematoxylin on the H and E section. And uh, the, the point, of course, is that uh, all of the white cells in the body are flying over this as they go through the bloodstream and go through the heart, but do not have any access. So this is why endocarditis untreated was uniformly fatal in the pre-antibiotic era. I only got two minutes left to finish my endocarditis lecture here. So I'm going to suggest to you that you read what's in the, uh, the bold-faced print. Su suffice it to say that this really is one of the great diseases uh, because you just have to think about it to make the diagnosis. You have to think about it. And this is, you have to suspect it because one of the things that can happen, particularly in primary care, is the patients come in with nonspecific symptoms and you give them antibiotics and you suppress it, but you don't cure it. And you may make the bacteria more resistant. Blood culture is important. Now echocardiogram shows the vegetations. <clears throat> I want you to be able to rattle this off on the tip of your tongue. There were no splinter hemorrhages, ulcer nose, Janeway lesions, or petechiae, or Roth spots. <coughs> And some skin lesions, I'm going to show you some, some pictures that I took over the years from patients I saw here in Columbia. This is staph endocarditis with this pustule on the skin. See things on the skin, think endocarditis. This guy has got a pustule on his nose. These are Janeway lesions, spots on the hand. Here's the same patient. This was a lady I showed you earlier with a big splinter hemorrhage in the nail bed, called a splinter hemorrhage. This is her heart showing the vegetation of the aortic valve. This guy had a few petechiae on the heels, he had pseudomonas, petechiae, little red spots. This is a ruptured papillary muscle. And I'm going to leave you with this, that viridan strep are the most common cause of endocarditis. Staph cause about 20 to 30 percent. All sorts of bacteria occasionally cause it. And one final point is that the staphylococcal endocarditis, two basic syndromes of it, one on the right side of the heart and the other on the left side of the heart. Endocarditis on the right side of the heart, the tricuspid or pulmonic valve, staph, people shoot up IV drugs. And in that case, the, the emboli that break off would not go to the brain and cause a stroke or to the spleen and cause left upper quadrant pain or the kidneys that cause flank pain and hematuria, but they would go where if it was on the right side of the heart? Lungs. So you often see patchy bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. So I'll stop there. Thank you, endocarditis.